We receive words that are not our own. Whenever you talk about tongues, you always elicit some emotional reaction. I don't care who it is. Oftentimes, you're going to find people, particularly on the charismatic or Pentecostal side, who are defensive because of an experience that they've had. It'll boil down to um, going back and forth and them telling those who don't believe what they believe that you just don't have faith. You're just not um, filled with the spirit. But is it that simple? What has happened is that we just have not read the Bible correctly. And when I say we, I mean those who hold to this view of this speaking in tongues that sounds more ecstatic, more babbling, more gibberish like. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to look at some of the people, some of the proponents who have given some teachings on tongues and let's just see where they're wrong and make no mistake about it. They are wrong. They go against the Bible. It is literally the Bible versus them. Before we get going, I want to kind of give a little bit of background on how and why we even have tongues or the actual proper terminology would be language. The word that's used in the Greek for the word tongues is the Greek word glossa, which means either one languages or it can mean the actual member in your mouth, the actual tongue. But for us in this conversation, we're obviously speaking about these languages. Are these some special spiritual language? Is it a known language like uh, English or Spanish or German? Some angelic language? What is it? So let's recall how God first introduces these diverse languages. God tells the people to be fruitful, to multiply all over the earth. And so what do they do? They disobeyed. They stayed in one place and built this great city. God has to come down and confound the languages. And so when God confounds the languages, what do they do? They scatter. So it's the use of these languages to get people to move about the world. However, what they did not do as they were supposed to, as they should have, was to take the glory of God with them. And so as the world fills with evil, God shows particular interest in the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. And he gives them, as he says in, in Romans, as Paul says in Romans, the oracles of God, the, the revelation of God. We find out that it's always been God's mission, that God's plan to involve the entire earth, not just the children of Israel. Paul lets us know that. Uh, in Galatians and Ephesians, and we're going to read it also again, and we're going to also read about this mystery in Acts. But before we go there, it's important to understand, obviously, that most of you know that these languages, this gift is a spiritual gift. But we need to understand what is the purpose of these spiritual gifts. Because what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of this. And none of that is how God ever intended it. Spiritual gifts are given for, as Jesus says, so that we would testify of him. Call what he says in John. In chapter 15, verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So they're going to testify of who? A generic God? Of the Holy Spirit? No, they're going to testify of Jesus. They're not going to testify of the goodness of God in their life, that God has blessed me, God is going to do this in my life, God has done that. No, they are going to testify of Jesus. The whole point of every spiritual gift, and we're going to see this, is so that the church can be built, can be grown. And there's a reason why we need this particular gift, this one that we're talking about now, this gift of languages, because remember when Jesus meets the apostles, these, these disciples in Acts 1.8, what does he say? 
He says that you shall be my witnesses after you receive the Holy Spirit and come upon you. You shall receive power. And then what? You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. Well, that's fine. They're used to Jerusalem and Judea. In that, in that region, there are Jews, people who speak the same language. So not a problem. Then he says, not only Jerusalem and Judea, but also into Samaria. Well, these are these Samaritan cousins who also speak the same language. Here's where the part gets a little iffy, a little dicey, a little complicated. we got a problem, Houston, because when we go to the uttermost parts of the world, they don't all speak the same language. So what are we going to do? How am I going to testify about you, Lord, to someone who doesn't know what I'm saying? Enter in the spiritual gift of languages. Remember, God is trying to build up his church. And so every spiritual gift he's given, he's not giving these gifts for you to shower upon yourself the love of God. It's not saying, it's not that God has given you a gift so that you can love yourself. I have the gift of healing, so I want to heal myself. I have the gift of giving, so I want to give to myself. That is not what God has gifted us for. The purpose of each gift is for the benefit of others. And we're going to see that later on. And so, and so does what Jesus says is going to happen? Does it actually happen? Well, sure it does. In Acts 2, we know the story, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they begin speaking these languages. Well, now it's real important to understand why he's doing what he's doing the way he's doing it. There are only a few times in the Bible where we see these languages actually being spoken. One, in Acts 2. Acts 8, it doesn't specifically say so, but we, we are pretty sure, we all agree that, uh, that these people down in Samaria, that they speak in these languages. We know so because Simon, the sorcerer, sees it and he wants to pay for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then we see it uh, at Cornelius' house. Then we see it with John's disciples, John the Baptist, who was running around the countryside. We see that with him. Well, one, why did it happen this way? Well, remember, Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. So on the day of Pentecost, what happens? In this region, the first region, this is where they see the Holy Spirit poured out and they begin speaking these languages. And who receives it first? These Jewish apostles. Then we see these other Jews from other, other lands who speak differently. So he's going to deal with Jews first. Then after Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria. So the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. But what's interesting is they did not receive the Holy Spirit under the hand of anyone who is not a Jew, specifically anyone who is not a Jewish apostle. Philip is down there and they believe, but they did not receive the Holy Spirit. So who, who shows up? Peter and John. Why? Well, because they are the ones who are going to give validity to what these Samaritans do, which is receive the Holy Spirit. What God doesn't want is a divided church. There are prejudices and favoritisms and, and, and even racism, like it is in some cases today, certainly at that point. The Jews did not get along with a lot of people who were not Jewish. As a matter of fact, other nationalities and other ethnicities were the same way. But God is trying to build a church, a body, and he didn't want these frictions and schisms. So if the apostles, these Jewish apostles, who God said he is going to build his church on, Jesus Christ obviously being the chief cornerstone, but upon these apostles, they are going to lay hands, give authority and validation to what happened. They did, they did so on the day of Pentecost. Uh, it's under their hands that people receive the Holy Spirit. In Samaria, it's under their hands. So Jews could not say that these Samaritans, though they're believers, they don't have the same power that we have. They don't have the same Holy Spirit because who testifies they do? The very same people who witnessed and gave authority for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Then we go to Cornelius's house. The Bible talks about that. And we're going to read this passage. We're going to see what's happening here. And I want to address something that uh, Dr. Michael Brown brings up because he makes an error in this. And obviously because it is his, his inclination to believe that these sort of tongues that we see today are real. He is charismatic. And so he believes in this. Uh, but do the scriptures bear this out? I don't think so. What makes what Michael Brown says uh, important is that he is the go-to guy for many Pentecostal and Charismatics. One, because he's a Dr. Brown. Um, and he does speak in a scholarly way, but that doesn't mean that he's not incorrect. I mean, obviously there are doctors who 
believe opposite of, of what he believes. And so let's listen to what he says and see if we can notice the error in what he's saying. We see something happens when the Holy Spirit comes on the believers in Acts 8, when they're baptized in the Spirit, but it doesn't say they spoke in new languages. But in Acts 10 and in Acts 19, they speak in languages or they speak in tongues. And in Acts 19, they also prophesy. What kind of tongues were those? Were they other languages. We don't know. It certainly wasn't to reach anyone because there was nowhere to, no, there weren't people to reach in these other languages like there were in Acts the second chapter. So who, who is it actually for? Who is it actually speaking about? Well, so one thing that he makes, that he, that he makes note of is that uh, this use of tongues, this use of languages was not to reach anyone. Well, we're not in a position to say so because we know that people came to the Lord as a result of this. Now, it doesn't let us know if only the people who spoke in these languages were the only ones to be saved or if others as a result of it. But there is something that we do know. Jesus said that when this happens, they will testify of me. Well, was Jesus testified to here? Yes, he was. There was a witness of Jesus and there's, some, there's another thing that we need to take into account why there was a need for these languages. I just said that the purpose, or one of the purposes obviously is to testify of Jesus, but another test purpose is to let the others, Jews, also have some sort of validation that others who are not Jewish are also part of the body. Paul tells us that all believers have been baptized into this one body, so all believers have the Holy Spirit. But what's happening in Acts is something that is not going to happen ever again. God is unfolding salvation for the masses for a reason. When he starts first with the Jews and the Samaritans, as he says, and then the Gentiles. And so there needs to be some sort of validation. So the Holy Spirit serves as a marker, um, some way that we can all know that we have this commonality, that we, ha that we are all part of this same body. And so it serves as evidence. Let's read this chapter in Acts and see if we can kind of see this. Verse 25 in chapter 10, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I myself a man also. And he talked with him and he went in and found many who had come together. Listen to verse 28. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Well, what's Peter getting at here? It's, hey, we've got this issue. We've got these issues, but God doesn't want that. Whatever God has clean, we're not, we are not to be separated. Peter hears this. Recall Peter's dream. And so Peter is talking about this division, this schism that he has. But wait a second. We've got to fix this. And so Peter tells him about the dream that he had about the, the, the unclean food and so forth. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So he's making it clear the Jews thought that they were God's people and only they were God's people. Peter is letting us know, no, it's not. That's not the case. Even though it hadn't been fully shown in the past, now it is. Recall, there's a passage that, 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 that gets tossed out, uh, the quoting of Joel, where he says that he shall pour out his spirit on all flesh. Well, the word that's used, the same word that's used in Hebrew, is the same word in Greek. It's colon in, in Hebrew, but it's pasopon in Greek. It means all, each, or every. How do you know which one it is? Well, context oftentimes tells us, does God pour out his spirit on all flesh? No, everyone is not going to have the Holy Spirit. Everyone is not gonna have God's spirit poured out on them. But what God does mean is that he's gonna pour his spirit out on each flesh, on each kind of flesh. So there won't be just that he's pouring out his spirit on just the Jews, the nation of Israel, but also on the Samaritans, also on Gentiles. Paul is going to let us know that that was this mystery that was revealed to him, that it was always God's intended purpose to bring in everyone. So back to the scriptures. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached. 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Verse 40, him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So he's saying, he's letting them know that he wasn't revealed to everyone, just these chosen people who happen to be these, these Jewish apostles. It's important to know that because Jesus is saying that these are the ones that he's building his church off of. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify. Remember what he says in, in John about when they received the Holy Spirit, also in Acts, to preach to the people and to testify that is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Let's drop down to verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who had heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues or languages and magnifying God. So the Jews are astonished. Why? Because, wow, this spirit has been poured out on not just the Jews, not just Israel, but the Samaritans. OK, we can see that those are our cousins. But even on these Gentiles, which goes to the point. So, so far, I think everything that I've said so far, how I'm lining this up so far, it seems to fit. It seems to connect. Right. So we've seen the spirit poured out on obviously the Jews, starting with the apostles. They are the foundation. Then other Jews, then the Samaritans, then the Gentiles. Again, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the other most parts of the world. That, that means the, the Gentiles. It's happening just like that. And there is now no division. No one can say it's just us. It's all about us Jews. You guys are, are, are believers. That's fine. But you're not quite at the same level as we are. And then, of course, we see the majority of the New Testament is written by who? By Paul. And Paul is a, an apostle to who? Not to Israel, but to the Gentiles. Then there's one last group who we see speaking these gifts, these tongues, these languages. That is the followers of John the Baptist. Remember, they're still running around the countryside preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. They're preaching what John was having them to preach, but they never had a chance to see or to experience what Jesus was doing. And so now they come to them and then they receive the Holy Spirit. So to kind of answer what and to correct what Dr. Brown is saying, you cannot say that they weren't speaking um, in a language to grow the church. Because we just know that people got saved. We just don't know who all it was. Was it only Cornelius' household? No, it doesn't say that. It says the Gentiles. So which Gentiles? It didn't just say just Cornelius' household. In 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, Paul says some very interesting things. He says that whoever speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to man, but to God. And whoever speaks in a tongue edifies himself. That's not a negative, that's, but it's saying that's for private use, not for public use. And if it's to be spoken in public, there needs to be someone who is gifted with interpretation, not someone who knows the language, but someone who's gifted with interpretation, an interpreter, someone who has the gift of interpretation that he spoke about in the 12th chapter. So what's the point? The point is it's not normative to think that it is an earthly language. If it was an earthly language, others could understand it. Now, I want to kind of stop there. He is off and there is no question that he is off. When Paul is writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, one, Paul is writing to cover some things that he has talked about before. There have been some questions that, that were asked by them of Paul. And Paul is writing back to cover some, some issues that he has. There's been these divisions. And obviously, again, Paul understands, recognizes that God does not want a divided church for any reason, whether it be ethnicities or, or what have you. And so the whole point of the book of 1 Corinthians is this, that there be no disunity, that there be unity. And so Paul starts off the book by speaking about these divisions that are there. He deals with these divisions as it, as it pertains to the body, um, as it pertains to these different, what we would call denominational differences, uh, as it pertains to marriage. But then 
in chapter 12, he says, now concerning spiritual things. The word that's used there is the Greek word pneumatikos, which, is, which means spiritual things, but you can take the spiritual gifts, that's fine. So now concerning these things, meaning that we got some issues regarding spiritual gifts. And so he says, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant regarding these things, meaning what? You have been acting and exercising things in a way that was ignorantly done, unknowingly. Well, what is it? He says, well, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you mean? Well, what, that, that, that seems to be a little bit confusing, right? Well, what he means is this. You all have the Holy Spirit. The way that you say Jesus is Lord is because of that. But you cannot have that same Holy Spirit and then say Jesus is a curse. Well, Paul, who's saying Jesus is a curse? You are. That's why I'm telling you, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning these things. You are, now this is my take and see if it flows, you are unknowingly saying things that you should not. One of those things you're saying is that Jesus is a curse. Well, how do you do that? Well, if you're speaking in this battle, in this ecstatic language, to some, it's going to sound like you are saying Jesus is a curse. You don't know what you're saying. You're just speaking. Let's see if, if, if what I say holds true going forward. But Paul says something very important about spiritual gifts, especially tongues, uh, in verse 7. Look what he says. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all, for the benefit of all. The purpose of these spiritual gifts is for the benefit of all, for others. It's not for you. It's for others. You've got this particular gift, but you, but you exercise the gift on yourself. No, it is for the benefit of others. He's going to relay this or repeat this theme again in chapter 14. And so it's important. If we know that the purpose of these spiritual gifts are to testify of Jesus, that's the purpose, to grow and build the body, to edify the body. And Paul just says that these gifts are not for you, but for all, for everyone else. So keep that in mind. And so Paul is trying to let them know that you should not favor any one particular gift over the other. Because what happens if you see a gift that you think is, that's the good gift. That's a man, that's, that's the gift that everyone is, is talking about, that everyone seems to go crazy over. Well, I want that because man, I want to have that same sort of, that same sort of, of, of connection with God. It's kind of like when, when guys sit and watch a football game or a basketball game or a baseball game or what have you. Yeah, I want to be that guy. I want to be that quarterback or that running back or that wide receiver or what have you. I want to be that man. I want to be the man. Or someone is singing. I wish I could sing like that person. Same thing with these spiritual gifts. And Paul says, don't desire these particular gifts. First of all, it's the Holy Spirit that gives you the gifts anyway. But don't desire and compete these one. Why? Because you're going to exercise them or try to exercise in these gifts in a way that's inappropriate. And it's not you. We've got a hand. We've got a foot. We've got an eye. We've got an ear. And neither one of our body parts can act or try to be the other part. Neither body part is useless or not as important. Stub your toe, stub your little toe and see what happens to the rest of your body. Have a little small headache, a little small nerve in your brain can, can knock you out, uh, just set you back, right? A cold or a sniffle. So every part of the body is important. And Paul relays that as it pertains to this church body. But before we get to chapter 14, there's chapter 13 we call the, the great love chapter, right? Well, why is that there? Because Paul is saying this is, the, this is the attitude that all these spiritual things ought to be coupled under, out of love. I've got this gifting and I'm gonna use it on the other believers of the body to grow the body because of love. Why? The love of God, I love him so much, and because I love my fellow man. I wanna see them come to an understanding that I have about Jesus Christ, and so I wanna tell them. But here's where we get off. Verse one, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And so some are gonna say that this is this angelic language. The difference between chapter, uh, between the difference between Acts and 1 Corinthians is, Acts was about an actual language, but Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is about this angelic language. Well, Paul is going gonna, is gonna to kind of debunk that in just a little bit here. But just in verse 13, we know he's not speaking seriously about some angelic language. We know he's speaking hypothetically. Why? Well, let's read the next verse. 
And though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Paul's point is that love is the is the mechanism that causes us to do what we do. If I don't, if I do whatever I, whatever it is I do, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. How do we know he's speaking hypothetically? Well, does Paul have all knowledge? Does he understand all mysteries? No. Has Paul, according to scriptures, we know that has Paul ever removed a mountain? No. Paul is speaking hypothetically. If I can do all that stuff, no matter how great you think I am, if I have if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Same with you guys. You all are fighting for a particular gift. For love of others, no, but for love of self. You're trying to edify yourself. And I made that, I said that purposefully because the question keeps coming, or the answer keeps coming up as to the purpose of speaking in tongues is what's to edify self. That's not what, what Paul is saying at all. I won't get into this issue of cessation uh, if certain gifts cease or not, at least right here. I'm gonna cover something in just a little bit and then I'll let you draw your conclusions after that. When Michael Brown says that these tongues are to edify yourself, well, now we've got a contradiction, don't we? You just told us the purpose, of, well, Jesus told us the purpose of spiritual gifts are to um, testify of him, which in doing so builds the body up, right? Paul says he just told us that the purpose of these spiritual gifts and tongues are to edify the body. It's for everyone else. But now we're saying that it's for edifying yourself? Well, no. In every language, the word but is a word of contrast. Even in Hebrew, even in Greek, it's a word of contrast. If I say, hey, to a friend, this person really likes you. Uh, they think you're a great person. They're a great person as well. Um, they have great parents, come from, a, come from a good background, nice job, well-mannered, loves the Lord, but. Well, I just nullified or just kind of ran over everything I said that was nice before I said but, because now you're worried about what's happening after the but. It won't be at the same level um, or good like the first portion is. It's a contrast. And the contrast is not that they're both going in the same direction. If they were on the same levels talking about the same thing, we would use the word and. So Paul is going to use this word but to contrast something. So he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you desire that you may prophesy. So wait a minute, why should someone desire that they prophesy, especially considering that spiritual gifts are not something that we can desire or get? Well, he doesn't, he, what he is speaking about is, and I'll show you this in the Greek, is the word prophecy has two meanings. The word prophecy really just means uh, a revelation. And so to give a revelation of God, there's two types of revelations that there can be. One, a foretelling, meaning this is going to happen in a few days or in a year, or what God is going to do in the land. And then there's the fourth telling, telling what God has said, what God is revealing, primarily through his word. Now, we have to remember also in these days, there was no written word for everyone to see. And so part of what people were doing, this gifting that they were getting, was the ability to also just reveal God's um, plan of salvation, what God has done, what Jesus Christ has done, just testifying of him. That fits. And there are numerous examples, especially uh, in, in, um, in antiquity, that shows us how this word in just your regular old um, course of business, that this word is used generically, not of God's revelation, but just as a revelation in general, just of what's happening, uh, of just telling something that someone has said, and in this case, telling what God has said. And so God says um, that we should desire to do that. I'm going to show you something in just a second to how we know that's exactly what he's talking about. The Greek makes that clear. Verse two, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But there it is, he who prophesies of these revelations speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. These two are contrasted, why? It's not because they are both on the same level that one is a benefit and the other one is also a benefit. No, there's a, there's a contrast. If I say to you, hey, what did that guy say? And the guy says to me, only God knows. That's where the phrase comes from. Only God knows he is speaking mysteries to God. Only God knows what he's talking about. But the person who is giving these revelation, he does what? He speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Isn't that the whole purpose of the body? One 
if the way you take these tongues are to build up yourself, you're not doing what God said to do. You're not, you're not following the purpose of these spiritual gifts. You're just building yourself up. Is that a good thing? Where in the scripture does it say that the spiritual gifts are ever used to build up yourself? You won't find a passage where the spiritual gifts are used to edify yourself. Oh, well, what about when this person prayed for themselves? No, praying for yourself is not a spiritual gift. What spiritual gift is used to, this guy has a gift of healing, so he healed himself. Well, Paul had the gift of healing. Did he heal himself? No. <laughs> I recall God saying, uh, basically, I'm paraphrasing, shut up, my grace is sufficient. So, let's stay consistent with the scriptures, right? Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies a church. But he who prophesies edifies a church. I wish you all spoke with languages, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in, in these languages, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So there needs to be some edification of the body for this to be good. Two things, one in English. Notice there's a contrast, there's a difference between the singular word tongue and the, and the plural word tongues. Why? Because the person speaks in a tongue, this ecstatic, there's only one type of ecstatic babbling, right? The person does this, this ikabakashama, whatever you're saying, who knows what you're saying. All you're doing is edifying yourself. You're making yourself feel good. You're building yourself up. Now, the person who speaks in these plural languages, these plural tongues, those are different languages. Greek, Spanish. How would you refer to those languages? You wouldn't refer to, to two, three, four, five different languages as up in a plural, I mean, in a singular sense, you would refer to them in, in a plural sense. And that's what Paul is doing. And so he's contrasting, um, he's going to contrast the singular versus the plural. But I said the Greek lets us know what the purpose of, of speaking in these languages is. He says something in, in verse 1 and in verse 5 in the Greek that makes it a little clearer. He says that I desire, um, but desire the spiritual things. Then he says, our English says that you may, especially that you may prophesy. Well, especially that you may prophesy is not actually the word. It says this, malandehena prophetuete, which is rather in order that you prophesy and that you give this revelation. He says the same thing again in verse 5, where verse 5 says, now I want you all to speak in languages. Your English says, but even more to prophesy, the word that's used there, there's this henna that's used there, which is a, it means in order. He says, but, he says, malon de henna prophetuete, rather but in order you prophesy, or in order, but in order that you prophesy, that you preach. Remember, I'm saying this is what the, this is what the word, the context for this word prophetuete means in this context that you preach, that you give a revelation. And so, I want you, if you're going to speak in these languages, that you do so in order to preach the gospel. Is that kind of making sense? Remember, he's saying that I want you, Jesus, I want you to preach me. I'm the gospel, preach me. When you have the Holy Spirit, you're gonna do that. And we keep seeing every instance so far that we've seen of someone speaking in these languages, the gospel was spoken. Jesus was testified to and the church was added to in every case. So that's the reason for the speaking in these languages. And whoever speaks in a tongue edifies himself. That's not a, a negative, that's, but it's saying that's for private use, not for public use. And if it's to be spoken in public, there needs to be someone who is gifted with interpretation, not someone who knows the language. Now, he says that, that these languages are for, that there's a way to do it in a private use and there's a public use. Somebody, quick. Show me the verse, show me the example of anyone ever in scripture speaking in these languages in a private use, in a private setting. We talk about someone going into their, their, their closet, their, their prayer closet and speaking or, or praying in tongues by themselves. Is there ever an example of that ever in scripture? No, there's not. Now, I'm going to address Romans 10 in a little bit, <clears throat> but we don't have that issue. We don't have that brought out in scripture anywhere. So when you say this is happening, you're saying so without any scriptural evidence. That's not a good thing, especially for someone of his stature, someone who is a doctor, who would say something without having any biblical evidence to back that up. 
to think that it is an earthly language. If it was an earthly language, others could understand it. And Paul could simply say, don't speak it unless you have someone else who understands that language. No. To make the statement that, is, that it, it is not an earthly language, again, give me the proof. Because we're going to read in just a second where Paul basically lets us know that, that this gift, like every other gift, there, there's, some, there's some knowledge to it. There's some understanding to it like other languages. And again, every time we've heard it, there is someone who spoke a different language coming to know Christ. And again, the point is there are no examples ever in Scripture of anyone speaking some angelic language. So let me just stop there. In Romans 10, we bring out this passage about the Holy Spirit having these or causing these groanings that are um, too deep for utterances. But here he clearly says in the word, we don't know what we should pray for, but the spirit itself make it intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. The word that's used there is the word stenogmos, which means it's an inward sighing. And this inward sighing, it says that, that these are groanings that cannot be uttered verbalized if it cannot if 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 it cannot be verbalized why would you then turn around and say that we're verbalizing it so he's not speaking about some sort of angelic prayer language some groanings that are verbalized they cannot be verbalized stop saying this passage has to do with tongues you are making a mockery of the scriptures you simply don't understand the scriptures or you're trying not to because even in the english it says these are groanings that cannot be uttered and then you turn around and say that they have been uttered verse 6 paul says now brothers if i come to you speaking in languages how will i benefit you unless i bring some sort of revelation or knowledge or prophecy okay so unless you don't understand what i'm talking about how will it benefit you even if lifeless instruments such as a flute or harp do not give distinct notes how will anyone know what is played and if the bugle gives an indistinct sound who will get ready for battle look what he says verse 9 so so with yourself if with your tongue, now he's speaking in this case about the actual member, you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will just be speaking into the air. Let me stop. Paul has given two insults so far and we didn't catch them. If a person says you, what did he say? Only God knows, as he says earlier. And then he's just speaking into the air. Those are not compliments. Don't take them as such. He is intentionally saying, as a, as, a, as a way of putting you down, as a way of saying you're doing it the wrong way, you're just speaking into the air. What context would I ever say to you that he's just or she's just or they're just speaking into the air and you would take that as a positive, as, a, as an acceptable practice? No. Or only God knows what he's saying. You're speaking to God. Only, maybe God knows what he's like, talking about. That's where that, that comes from. It's kind of the idiom of the day uh, for Greeks, for Greek speaking people in that day. Uh, he's just speaking to God. He's speaking mysteries in the air. That's not a compliment, guys. That's, that's not what that means. Verse 10. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreign to the speaker, and the speaker will be a foreigner to you. That's not good. I don't want to speak, and then you don't understand what I'm saying. That's the whole point. Because every time we see languages being spoken, who are, are they speaking ever? Is there ever an example of anyone speaking languages, these tongues? To God, no, they're always speaking to other people, and the people hear it, and other people respond when they hear it, these languages being spoken. So yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Uh-oh, two things. One, he says, I get why you guys are doing this. You're just zealous and eager for this spiritual encounter. But if you want these spiritual gifts, desire to do what does he say? In building up the church or edifying the church. Does he say to, to desire to edify or build yourself? No. Well, that's in keeping with what I've been saying. Also, you speak the mysteries. It's like a coded language. Satan does not understand. Man does not understand. So when you pray in the spirit in an unknown tongue or a diverse tongue, when you're praying in the spirit, uh, you're praying a mystery not known to man, but known by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is praying through you. And I'm not really going to address Paul White too much because and I don't want to be mean but in terms of being able to execute the passage and in terms of understanding uh, scriptures I, I seriously doubt she understands anything having to do with Hebrew or Greek 
but even the English, her comments aren't worthy um, to even delve deeply into because they're not deep themselves. Just to notice that she makes a mockery of it, even when you listen, listen to her praying or speaking in English and forgetting what to say and just going to ay ya 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 ha ya that oh, in the name of Jesus let every ha ha ho ho anda ha ay ha rabasata and so when this guy Ruslan makes a statement um, that he's spoken in tongues he's experienced something happened people say that often something happened I know what I felt I speak in tongues. I'm, I'm not quite sure on like the baptism, the second baptism. Something definitely happened to me post salvation where I fell out and it was a wild experience. I couldn't move, and then someone put their their hand on my face and said, "Speak, child," and I spoke in tongues, and it was real, and I've done it since. And it's well, here's a response. Don't care what you felt. Don't care what you think you experienced. Some folks felt like they went to hell and back, went to heaven and back. No, you didn't. I don't care what you felt or what you thought. Some people, many you can testify to this, felt like they were in love. And what happened? Well, it just nothing was, it was heartburn. Who knows? Our feelings do not ever supplant the word of God, ever. I don't, or, nor do our experiences trump what the word says, amen? We can all agree on that. But one of the funny things is, is we think that if we pray a certain way, and I think Paula White said the same thing, we pray a certain way that the devil won't understand it. Well, first of all, the devil doesn't speak English. And how he interacts with us is with our heart and our mind. The devil doesn't have the ability to interrupt what God is doing. And if it's this coded language, this, this secret prayer language, I've got a question. You that think I'm wrong and speaking these, these tongues. When you speak in tongues, what happens? What changes? How come you seem to be getting the same level of attack as you were previously? How come you suffer the same things at the same rate that the rest of us who don't speak these tongues? Uh, why is that happening? Because if nothing is changing with you spiritually, then what's the point? I've demonstrated and said what the point is if you do it what I say is the correct way speaking these languages to testify of Christ, what happens to the church's attitude, but what happens when you do it? He said, if you believe, you shall, you will speak in tongues. The Bible does not lie. So if you're not, uh, if you haven't received it yet, it's something to do with your faith. And a lot of people, they get mad. They're, you're gonna see people argue in the comments, but that's really what it is. And so when he says it there, that it demonstrates a, a, a lack of faith, well, I'm gonna disagree, uh, but you show me uh, what you've done with your faith and I'll show you what I've done with my faith. You show me, if we want to get to the point, we don't want to do this, but when you start attacking people's faith and their love and their sincerity and whether they're saved, then let's start counting fruit. How about that? Uh, since Jesus said that uh, if we're in him, we're going to bear fruit. Um, let's start counting scalps. How many people have been led to Christ as a result of you being so faithful and, and, and full of the spirit? Well, we don't want to do that, nor should we uh, try, to, nor should we attempt to belittle someone else who differs with what we believe theologically by attacking or impugning their faith. So check it out, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, repent, one action, and be baptized, two actions, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's three separate actions. So anybody who tells you, oh, you don't have to be baptized, it says clearly that if you're not baptized, you will be damned in the Bible and Mark, and it's not talking about um, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. You see here, it's three separate actions. You repent, uh, you were baptized, and then you receive the Holy Ghost, then you receive the Holy Spirit. And so I need to cover these, these things where he, where he speaks in Acts 2, 38. Okay, so he relates that as being three different actions. That seems like he might have a point. Well, not so. In Greek, which again, I don't know what he, if his, his level of understanding of Greek is, but in Greek, this was called this ep-exegetical chi. It's where we use the word chi, which means and, as a way to say the same thing in multiple different ways. Oftentimes in scripture, you're going to see where God would say the same thing many different ways. How does a person become a believer? Is it by repenting? By being baptized? We start going down the list of all the things that have said, that are said uh, regarding salvation. We might come up with a list of, you gotta do this, 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 and this, right? Well, no, it's just the same way of saying 
It's a, it's, it's a way of saying the same thing different ways. Like he refers to John 3, where he says to, uh, to Nicodemus, um, be born of water and spirit. Well, they'll take it that you're born of water and spirit. The spirit part is being baptized. No, it's what's called the exegetical chi. And of course, if you read further down in John 3, uh, those two elements, water and spirit, end up becoming one element. And he's referring to what happened, what God is speaking of in Ezekiel about how he's going to pour his spirit into man and wash them. And so he uses the word um, spirit and water interchangeably speaking about what he's going to do with his spirit in man's heart. Mark 16, 17, and these signs, this is the important one, and these signs will accompany those who believe. These signs will. Some versions say these signs shall uh, accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will speak. If you believe, you will speak in new tongues. And then he focuses on Mark chapter 16, the latter part. Well, to rebut that, two things. One, either, and I take it this way, that the latter half, I'm one who believes that the latter half of Mark uh, is not in the originals. It was added. <clears throat> but let's say I'm incorrect and it does belong. Fine, doesn't change anything. Because if you're going to say that those people who are saved, by the way, a case can be made, probably not the strongest case, but a case can be made that he's speaking um, of those those uh, uh, disciples, but I don't think that's a strong point. But let's say these are the signs that shall follow them. And he's he's clear that if you don't speak in tongues, it's because you're not saved because these are the signs that shall follow them. So my brother Marcus or anyone else who believes that, have you, Marcus or anyone else, have you cast out any demons? Have you laid hands on the sick and caused them to recover? Maybe, I don't know if you've even gone so far as to raise the, raise the dead. Have you maybe drank, and, drank some poison? Have you played around with some serpents? Have you done all these things? Because it's not just this, these tongues that you say that believers who feel this way shall do. It's other things. Have you done those things? And I'm pretty sure you're going to say, well, not all of these things, right? And so you can't impugn folks for for not doing this that you say you do the tongues part, but not the other part. And so I know some people are going to have issues with what I'm saying. That's fine. The question is this. If we don't have a biblical example of what you're saying, why would you say it? Why would you follow that? If God has given you what you need in the scriptures, there's a couple things you need to remember. Every time that we see tongues, what's there? What's present? One, testimony of Christ. Two, an apostle. One of the apostles, not one of these modern day apostles, but one of the apostles are there. They lay hands on it. They're giving authority, validation to what's happening every time. Secondly, uh, it's always a known language. We don't have any examples of this angelic language. The reason why, thirdly, that some people believe that these gifts have ceased, one reason is after 1 Corinthians, we don't see this issue of tongues being brought up. So was it just for the growing of the church at that time? Now, when someone asked me, hey, do you believe that, um, that these gifts of tongues are still around, that, that they've ceased? Again, I don't mind saying I don't know. And so I'll say I don't know because Paul did say, uh, don't forbid tongues. And somebody will say, well, that was for that time. Well, I don't know. I'll just, I'll leave it like this. If a person says that they have that gift, as long as, if, if I see it done just the way Paul is saying it just the way that the scriptures have given evidence for, that it's an actual language, uh, then amen. Because there are still some people on the planet who don't speak any known language that we have and who have not heard the gospel. How does God reach them? I don't know. So I'm not going to foreclose it. I'll just say this. I've never seen it. I've seen what people say it is. But if you think you have the, the ability, then fine. Do it the correct way. There needs to be an actual language and somebody needs to be hearing the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, are these people who have these, this understanding of this ecstatic gibberish babbling that no one can understand where they're just edifying themselves, they do it in their own prayer closet, their own prayer time for the benefit of them and not, not others, is that the correct way? No, that is absolutely the incorrect way. That is the unbiblical way. That is the ungodly way. That is the selfish way of doing it. 
I don't mean to be harsh about it, but it's the truth. Regardless of what, and there was a time when I was at a Pentecostal church where I believed that I spoke in tongues and I go back and look at it. Yeah, did I really? I mean, what happened? We were just sitting around and got kind of caught up because I asked this question. How come we never see people who speak in these languages do so in the grocery store or, or at school or at work? Uh, guy, guy has a court date uh, for a traffic ticket. Speak in tongues there. You go in for a job interview. Speak in tongues at the job interview. You're on the, the train or the bus or, or you know, Uber, you're on the airplane. Speak in, speak in tongues on the airplane. Watch what happens. So I just say be consistent. Uh, stop letting your Holy Spirit stop um, outside the church door. It, it, it's only in a church meeting or at the church or, or in private or around some other Christian settings. But this is what I do know. With a sincere heart, if you, if you are praying and you speak English or you're talking to someone about Jesus in English or whatever language that it is in, um, it's going to be to magnify God and to grow the body, either um, in numbers or spiritually speaking. So I hope this has been helpful. If anyone has a, has a disagreement, that's fine. Please leave a comment. I'll try to address it. Um, and then we'll keep it classy, keep it clean. We'll keep it moving. And if we need to do another video, then so be it. Amen.